That's good. So um, one of the things that we wanted to do when Lisa and I sat down with um, Jill is we were thinking about how to get influential HR people together and how to, to sort of you know, enable that. And the circle of peers format that we'd already got seemed to fit. And then it was certainly helped by the fact that our company colours are almost <coughs> identical. And so there is a, a sort of vision of pink around the, the, the room. So do, do uh, enjoy that. But for those of you who are not familiar, it's really what we're seeing out in the, in the workplace at the moment is everybody is running at maximum capacity. And I, there's a part of me that just wonders how long we can actually sustain this. Um, but... So all the more important for you to sort of create a space for you to just share ideas, formulate some thoughts, um, inform each other, because learning from each other is really rich. Because you can say, well, we tried that. And then most importantly, to network. And I think the thing that saddens me most is when people say they're too busy to network. This is like saying you're too busy to breathe. You know, you've got to get out there. And, and talk to people. <coughs> so, welcome to today. Um, so, we've got a nice mixed um, view. If I start with um, when I was thinking uh, about the session, and one of the things we're having fun with is coming up with new logos for the things. And, you know, for those of you who wonder what those little columns are there, they need a little bit of encouragement. So, the fiddlers amongst you, please start playing with them because they're little slinky, flexible things. Um, so, three ideas. Um, I suppose, first of all, if we're going to embrace this concept of flexibility, we're going to need to think about perhaps working smart. And then, you know, how do we? How do we cram even more into that full pot? And why should we work flexibly? What are the drivers? Where is it coming from? And then the legal legal stuff. I'm delighted that I've got Rebecca here who will do cover that with with us beautifully. Um, so that's the sort of format of today. And if we think about um, what do I really mean by that, I suppose there are a couple of things. So if we're talking about um, working together um, and, and working smart. Perhaps one of the key things that I think is important is clarity. Um, this is really about the clarity of purpose, um, to be absolutely sure, to see the vision of where you want to go. Um, the other aspect is common values. And I think that when people start talking in the we, you know that you've got some shared common values. But when people are seeing things in isolation and talking about the I, you know that those values are not commonly shared. And I think that is absolutely one of the critical things in terms of the way you work, your ethics, how will we tackle this, what is our culture, and also in terms of customer relations. Um, we can see some appalling um, customer relationship aspects where the customers are definitely not king. Um, or if you're a fan of Hotel India where the customer is God, Maybe that's going a little bit too far, but um, it was very interesting to be in a hotel, and I just looked down at the tablecloths and thought, wouldn't pass muster in Hotel India. You know, Taj, they would have been ironing these tablecloths. So again, it's about these shared ways of working. And it's also about expenditure. So when your people are more zealous about the expenditure of the company money and how things 
monies are going to be spent, you know that you're on the winning ticket. So this clarity uh, comes from a, a lot of things. It also comes from moving from micromanagement to outcome-based. We've been working flexibly for so many years, and I now tend to forget. But the thing that really helped us was, be able, was to be able to identify how much would be uh, payable for a particular part of the job and what is an actual outcome of that, rather than, I've run this person, they're working from home, it's nine o'clock, where are they? So being able to view the work as an outcome rather than something that has to be time served. The other interesting thing is to trust that people are going to get it right. Do people actually want to do a bad job? I don't think they do. I don't think people get out of bed in the morning and say, I'm going to do a bad job today. I think things happen to them that make the job go badly. And maybe some of those things are the actual quality of their managers. Another aspect in terms of helping clarity to get, to get through is um, perhaps giving feedback as and, as and when it happens. So if something's going really well, praise immediately. If something's going not so well, explain what it is. Use questioning technique and get it out in the open. And what worries me is when people wait for three months, a month, to give some negative feedback. It's been and gone. I've coined the phrase puppy training, which sounds a bit sort of derogatory, but it's not meant to be. You know, if you've got a new puppy, you're praising it to the hilt when it doesn't do what it shouldn't do um, in the kitchen or wherever, and you're telling it off immediately when it does do something wrong, like chew your favourite shoes or handbag or whatever. So the same philosophy can be applied to people. They do need to know when they're getting it right and when they're getting it wrong. And if they can then be encouraged to discover why they're getting it wrong through your use of question technique, much more effective. So this, this, this um, giving feedback is absolutely incredibly powerful. And it's also, going back to Hotel India, um, what struck me there was their feedback is mainly on the negative. So it would have been nice to have seen much more positive feedback. So, I mean, do go and have a look at it. It's fascinating. You only need to watch one program and you've got it. You don't need to watch all four. Um, but I, I think, you know, this, this whole thing about positive enforcement and po positive enforcement in a public uh, arena, don't do it in a, a locked room. And, that, of course, if you've got some negative feedback to give people, the last thing you want to do is to go and uh, take them to a quiet room. Because everybody knows that they go in there for a rollicking. Isn't it better to do the light touch negative feedback there and then and then still be friends rather than saving it all up until it's too bad um, or, or it's too difficult to carry on? So that's that. So if we then move on um, in terms of tactics to cope with that never-ending onslaught of distractions. And I thought I'd share this with you because uh, I came across this thing. Anybody heard of this? Productivity Ninja? Well, the title appealed to me. Um, and when I actually then sort of scanned it and, and, and had a look at it, I thought, this guy's got a, a thing or two. He's actually based in Brighton, which is, so he's got to be good, he's in Sussex, you know, that's, that's great. Um, it's East Sussex, not West Sussex, but hey, no, don't forgive him that. Um, but um, what I thought was really interesting here is that um, he's come up with a couple of really fab ideas that definitely uh, 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 appealed to my um, gnat-like attention. One was a diagram where you've got uh, an option to process your emails. And it's beautifully simple, and now of course I can't find it, but um, it actually uh, takes you through a little flow diagram and you, know, you can actually sift out. I still want to try it on my inbox, but um, this is one of my weekend tasks, so I fancy trying it. Because it's actually sort of saying, look, 
how do you just, it's a little decision tree, so what do you ditch quickly? So that was fabulous. He also comes off with this other idea of um, capturing and collecting information. And if you're like a magpie like me, I'm always capturing and collecting things. And my lovely friend Carol at the back there is, is sort of often wondering what, how on earth I, I do it, but I do. So I'll capture and collect it. And perhaps what I need to do better is to organise and review it and then decide what to do with this treasure trove of stuff that I've found. So he's got some really simple, good ideas. So I thoroughly recommend him to you. It'll be on the list that Eleanor will send out, uh, Graham Alcock. And if you're challenged, because there is this concept that time management is dead, because in our world at the moment we just can't um, cope with everything because we're, we're, we're bombarded. I mean, how many of you have um, a LinkedIn account? How many of you regularly contact people through LinkedIn? Okay, so that's another inbox that you've now got to look at. How many of you tweeting? Yeah, okay, so that's another one. How many of you use WhatsApp? Yeah, so that's another one. You get the drift, don't you? Yeah, and then there's the emails. <laughs> Thankfully, there's not much post these days. <laughs> but, you know, we do it to ourselves. This is the scary thing, you know. We've got this distractions and mailstorm going around. But there's another good book by David Allen uh, called Getting Things Done. So if you're feeling challenged in that area um, and want to develop a um, great uh, thing for you to do. Um, the other thing that I'd ask you to think about, and I think Dave Allen's best one, it's an oldie but a goodie, is actually book time for you in your diary. Find your own little colour code message and that this is your time. And even if it means that you take yourself to the nearest Starbucks or Costa, because they've got Wi-Fi and you'll still be connected. That's it. <laughs> and, you know, if you're not connected, you're feeling very vulnerable these days. So, you know, at least it's time for you. Um, I find that going to conferences is fabulous time for me because I can just sit there and absorb and I'll get all sorts of new ideas, but I'll also have time for me in that area. And the other classic, we all know about it, HR is horrendously bad at doing it, and that's learning to say no. There's some nods around the room. And then my final thought is, for God's sake, go easy on yourself. Because we're constantly beating ourselves up. So, you know, think about just ways of coping with these distractions. Try a few new ideas. Definitely worth a go. But the most important thing is, be kind to yourselves because the world isn't necessarily always kind to us. So then, moving on to the smarter workplace again. I mean, our world of work is changing. You know, uh, driving in and seeing astral towers, I thought, well, you know, the glass tower blocks, well, they're still there, but they're going to be there in a different place, in a different way. They're no longer going to be essential. Um, you know, I can remember in 1986, and yes, it was that long ago that we set up the business, um, Penny Cullen and I were absolutely intense, this is big shoulders and everything was going for it, uh, that we could not be seen as two women running a business around a kitchen table. Now, how perverse is that? You know, coming on for nearly 28 years on, um, Cullen Schofield's offices are actually in our home. So we've gone total circle, from having three floors in an office block in Haywards Heath, you know, to, to, to totally virtually working. And, you know, things are changing. Our lovely Eleanor, um, you know, wedded to her Mac when she started to work with us, I think was a little bit trepidatious about maybe having to move, and it was delightful to be able to say, well, use your Mac. And, okay, it's tracker pad's gone. So we'll pay for that, that's fine. But it's that flexibility, so the working ethos has got to change. And we are, the other thing is that we have to think about, I'm not too sure what to call them anymore. You know, we talk about Gen Y. Are they the millennials, or what are they? I think somebody does need to just classify and keep it standard. But 
One thing we do know is that they will demand good technology. Um, we've been working on a project recently where glitzy place, you wander into the building, you've got a pink bicycle, you've got an inflatable palm tree, bright, vibrant colours, the working space is fabulous, the, the staff restaurant is great, but can they get their technology right? No. They don't issue smartphones to people who they expect to be connected 24-7. And, you know, how can this happen? Um, so, the, the, the demand for technology is going to be there. Um, another thought is this guy, uh, or two guys, Clapperton and Van Hooty, have come up with a smarter working manifesto. Again, something quite interesting to look at. And here, in this book, they talk about um, workplace zones. And it's uh, quite a nice diagram. You see now, paradoxically, I can find the Richard thing, and you can just about see it. But they talk about zones, these concepts of work, workplace zones. And the idea is that perhaps in, in your office space, or wherever you're choosing to work, um, you should think about providing places for people to concentrate so that they can do focused individual work. Um, quiet place, somewhere private. I can remember coaching somebody um, a while ago who was getting into really deep water because she could not concentrate in an open plan office and was booking quiet meeting room space. And she was on the verge of a severe reprimand for that. Now, what lunatic is managing that person? We have an open plan office, you must use it. Whether you do the work well or not is irrelevant, but we have an open plan office, you must use it. Now, this inflexibility is going to really piss people off. Um, then the other thing is, if I toddle into an office in, in, in Gibraltar, I could actually see the IT teams um, huddled around a big whiteboard doing their rapid uh, development planning for the day. So what software problem are we going to solve today, Lance? And they all be huddling around this big whiteboard as they sketch around furiously, and that's their task for today. So that collaboration is fabulous. And also um, audio and video conferencing. Again, this, this interesting client that we've been working with have this fascinating idea of getting their sales team together for a weekly meeting on a Friday, drawn from all parts of the country, and then guess what? On the Friday evening, they have to drive home. What's the worst time of the day to drive home? Friday evenings. And then even better, they then have to implement whatever they've decided on the Friday on Monday. So what are they actually forcing their people to do? Those ones who are planful? are forcing them to work the weekend. <coughs> but this is nonsense. Why can't they shift the meeting to Thursday? You know, it's, it, it's just really strange. And why aren't they using audio and video conferencing more? They've got the technology, why aren't they using it? So the, it's this mentality of some people who are managing others. And then a contemplation zone. Quite like that, I get visions of you know pebbles and a rake and Japanese gardens. But um, maybe it's just the red seats outside here under the trees. You know, I love that idea. So you go and shove them out there. It's probably for the smokers. But again, smokers will often say that they will be contemplating while they're smoking, and they probably are. So if you allow smokers to go out and contemplate while they smoke, what about non-smokers? So this concept of fairness, again, is a, another thing, but some time out to just go. Um, we've uh, got a, a recent uh, thing in Collins Cove, much to, I think, Eleanor's delight, of Albert, an elderly uh, Dalmatian. She's going to kill me later. Um, so uh, Eleanor takes him for a walk. I don't know what, what contemplation goes on, but I think that's, it's liked by Albert, and it's certainly liked by Eleanor. So this whole idea of contemplation is, is critical. And then a zone to communicate. So just as we've got a zone here, it's a good communication zone. So some thoughts on the smarter working place. That one size will not fit all. And when you're planning new offices, if you have to have an office, 
think about those zones. And if you're working from home and you're going stir-crazy, think about perhaps having different ways to organise your time. Find a friendly coffee space or, or, or place or, or whatever. Um, the other thing that's interesting is this um, bricks, bites, and behaviour. Well, I love the bricks, so that's the bricks and mortar. And this book actually talks about activity-based working. So this, to me, is also about coming together for a particular project and then breaking away again. And I think we'll see more of this. People will gang up together for a particular project. Um, there's a, f a really good Deloitte study called Open Technology, where it's predicting the ways of the future, and it will, it will come to the flexible working. I mean, the lovely Pete over there, who will be your uh, delight and bane, because he's always uh, filming, um, works with Cullen Schofield and works with Lisa, but he's not but employed by us. But we include him in all sorts of things, uh, some of which involve alcohol and food and stuff like that, because he's part of our team. So this flexibility of workforce, you know, are they a worker or are they not, comes into this activity-based working. And where we do it, of course, depends. And then the bite stuff, as you could imagine, is all about unified communication, collaboration, and, of course, getting the wretched IT systems to work. As a small business, I sometimes, you know, think, oh, for God's sake. But then when I go into large businesses and find that they're even worse than we are, I, I suddenly feel very good. <laughs> um, so IT is going to be the bane of our lives, and if we can get that as slick as possible, it would be great. And then behaviour. And I think this is perhaps the most challenging We've got the intergenerational clashes that we might see, but it is a different thing managing somebody who you don't see every day. If I give you a Cullen Schofield analogy, and it won't be Eleanor, so she can breathe a sigh of relief, um, we have got a lovely lady who we, I nicknamed uh, our database scrubber. Now, she, <laughs> I'm so politically correct, you know, it's, Rebecca will slap me. Um, so, before we get visions of the marigolds on, but her job is to go into our database and make sure it's as clean as it can possibly be. That is it. Very outcome driven. I know that before we started to have her, our bounce rates were 17%, they're now under 5%. Her job is justified. She doesn't have any set hours, she can work the hours she wants to work. She prefers to do that because it's very flexible for her. Um, every now and again, we drag her into the office. We get rewarded by flapjacks. Um, she gets rewarded because she sees faces. So you can work totally remotely. But we will also do strange things, like just pick up the phone and say hi, <coughs> rather than leave them in this isolation and only contact them for the work issue. So you can have the equivalent of a uh, you know, water cooler conversation, but that can be over the phone. So I think some lovely thoughts in this book about how to, to change. And, you know, maybe if you've got some older workers in there or older managers, you might want to be thinking about just dropping a copy by the, her desks to say, how about? Um, then moving on to sort of um, flexible, working flexibly. I don't believe we've got any option but to, um, you know... I just can't understand the inflexibility of some organisations because they're just going to make it so much more difficult for themselves to recruit the talent that they need to have. Um, essential reading. Um, we've got downloads of these reports, but um, my favourite, top fave, is this one. It's the Future of Work report, August 2012. I'll go through some of them. There's a really nice... Um, future-proofing business through flexible working, and that's by CIPD Senior Diversity Network. Some good stuff there. And then the villain of the piece, flexibility or insecurity, you know, exploring the rise of zero-hours contracts. Um, Work Foundation got a lot of time for that. Those of you older in the tooth will remember it's the Industrial Society. But um, 
August 2013. Some good reading there because it is not the villain of the piece if it's found in the <coughs> and it can help both parties. So, some thoughts on that uh, essential reading. Um, so, this changing context of work, I really want to look at four areas. And we've got advanced technologies, we've got new societal values and changing demographics and rapid globalisation. So interesting uh, on that side. With the advanced technologies, we've got this issue of perhaps um, the nature of work is becoming much more complex than it used to be. Um, it's no longer only um, driving, producing widgets by hand, doing a bit of sheet metal bashing. We've now got robotics, we've got all sorts of technology in there, and it's technology dependent. And even the paperwork systems these days are getting more and more complex, unless of course you're in Gibraltar, where they still like carbon paper. And if you want to employ somebody, you need a triplicate copy of a handwritten form. And uh, so one of my clients who's shipping across 75 people this week is wailing a little bit. But uh, quite interesting. Um, and I think the other thing with this more complex work is actually this increase in collaboration, which I touched upon earlier, and getting people to manage their own working styles. We were talking earlier, if, if, if somebody's an early bird, we'll work with it. If, if somebody's a night owl, work with that. So do recognise how people prefer to work and work with it rather than work against it. Um, I think the other as aspect is that hierarchies are being disrupted in terms of um, some of those classic pyramids of, of, you know, I'm managing you. I always think about, you know, I'm more senior than you and more senior than you. Flatter organisations and the need to rapidly deploy people will make it less hierarchical in the workplace. But yet, if you go into some of the big blue chips, we've got hierarchies to die for. Um, so we need to try and have a look at that. I also sort of despair a bit about the sort of matrix management style, because to me, that's places to hide. <coughs> if you've got a classic matrix management where two people are reporting into different, uh, you know, two people are managing or having a reporting line in to one individual, it's very easy for the games of politics to be played. So the cleaner and simpler you can get the hierarchies, the better. Um, moving on to new values. It is interesting that one of the reports referred to the fact that the millennials will come into the workplace by 2030. Well, Ellen and I did a calculation, and we reckon that if they leave school at 19, they're already here. And I was talking to Terry earlier, and Terry reckons that she's already got them. So, you know, this increased um, desire for people to, to, to sort of work and their values are, are going to be absolutely uh, quite scary. And work will need to be personally meaningful for, for the new, newer generation. What will motivate them to get to work? What will motivate and excite them to work in? We can no longer think about the baby boomers who would work until the cows came home. And, you know, even Generation Xs would work long hours. Um, and we wonder about the costs of that as well. Um, people will want to think about autonomy and choice. And again, managers who've only got one trick, which is you do as I tell you to do, have got a real problem here. Because how do you get the best out of people who want to be involved? But then again, if we're talking about employee engagement, we're talking about involvement of people. And some of the best ideas come from groups of people. How are we going to solve this, folks? It's our problem, or how are we going to solve it? Or it's our opportunity, what's, what's the best way to capture this? Um, thoughts are that, uh, how many of you are into transactional analysis? One couple. Ed Byrne, 
If you haven't read his stuff, please do. Because what, what one of the reports is talking about is saying we'll need to move more to an adult-to-adult relationship. And perhaps the traditional employment relationship has been very much parent to child. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to feed you, I'm going to give you the wherewithal for your work, um, and you need to toe the lines. And if you don't, I'm going to wag my finger at you and call, tell, you the, tell you off. And so that also can bring out some, some errant behaviours of, you know, naughty child versus um, critical parent. So thinking about just that change in working styles. I feel quite sorry for managers sometimes these days because they really do have to up the game. Um, and that old adage that people don't leave the job, they leave, they leave the, uh, the manager is a classic. Um, also on that side with the demographics, we've got older workers in there. So we're going to f- see people genuinely not wanting to leave work for financial reasons as well as uh, mental reasons in terms of still wanting to be stimulated. Um, we're also going to see these multiple generations. There's a, a report on that called uh, 4G, um, where the four generations, we highlighted it in a blog that we did recently, um, a really good read as well so it's worth you having a look at that Um, but it is about learning how to accommodate this workforce so say for example you're in the uh, sort of physical area, I see no danger or I I can see lots of benefit by combining a perhaps less fit older worker with a youngster because you've got the benefit of the energy of you go and gravel into these spaces because I can't get get there because my knees are going. But hang on a second, the last time I encountered this problem, the X, Y, and Z happened. The youngster can learn from the old person, the old person gets a benefit and a boost from that energy in the young person. If that relationship can be forged, it's no different to the old master and apprenticeship relationship. Why can't we have some of that? You retain your product, your knowledge, you retain the sense of what you've done in the organisation, the organisation's history. So, you know, 4G, I think, is optimistic because I reckon it's actually 5G. There'll be five different generations working together. And I think that's going to be one of our most interesting challenges. We need to get into the heads of each of those generations to see what maximum benefit we can get. Um, now our dear friend Generation Y um, I was saying to Terry we've had in Cullen to go for bright young things for probably 10 years now and I wouldn't now be without them I've got a mother of a bright young thing sitting here <laughs> um, who's now gone but it's one of our cheekiest and best um, but, um, and Ellen is the latest reincarnation um, I don't believe, whilst it takes some energy, I, I wouldn't not wish to have the right young thing. They never do quite the same job in the, in the business, and they seem to find their own niche. And I think that we have to think about that. So I was talking to a client uh, yesterday, and they're absolutely snowed under. Uh, they've got lots of new projects to, go, uh, to, to, to be undertaken. So I said, well, you haven't got a graduate intake scheme. You know, why don't you take on, say, three graduates? Task them up with the ops director who's got all these projects. You'll be amazed with what they can do if they're given that responsibility and some guidance. And that will just release some of this um, uh, blockages that they're, they're finding. But they, you know, Generation Y will have new values and expectations around the working life. Maybe they're not going to be as driven as some of the earlier generations. Maybe they're also going to be more flexible, demand more flexibility. And maybe they're also wanting a little bit more social life with their work. So can we combine all of these things? Um, Some other recent research is saying that they actually value development over pay. So it shocks me when 
organisations will say, well, we haven't got the budget to qualify our people. I just, I can't understand that. <coughs> we need to have, find that budget, because how else are you going to retain them? You know, the costs of recruiting and uh, uh, re retaining people, I mean, there was one report that talked about 30,000 per post. I think that was widely overstated. But, I mean, in this room, what average would you put if you lost somebody, middling salary, how much do you reckon it costs you to replace? Any ideas? 5K? 10? So, you know, anything between 5 and 20K, and we can't afford to help somebody develop, and that would keep them. Even if it kept them for three, four, five, six months lo longer, they're still <coughs> getting that relative safety. And who knows, they might be uh, happier to stay longer. So, moving on to just globalization, um, really it's about customer expectations. How many of you use Amazon? How many of you expect next day delivery? I rest my case. You know, it's, uh, it's there. But just think about all those challenges that are facing Amazon in terms of capturing those opportunities and meeting that demand for this 24-7 full-on. No matter what time of the day it is, you can order from Amazon, and if you're okay within the time scales, you'll get it the next one, you know, or the next day. Um, amazing. And then the other thing is uh, sustainable growth. Um, I used to know a, a really lovely guy who uh, chaired Rento Kill, and for years he was known in the city as Mr. 10%, because year on year on year he delivered 10% growth and profit. Of course, until the time that he didn't. <laughs> um, then, of course, the city turned on him. But that sustainability, I think, is something that most organisations are looking for. And it's okay to peak one year, but can you sustain it? And sustainability will be looked for in many other things, I think. Um, we're going to be piloting the new version of the Investors in People standard. And one of the things that really interested me when we were being briefed about it is that they're now looking at sustainability. Can you keep on doing what you're doing? Um, so anybody can hit the jackpot once, but can you continue to uh, hit it? Um, so with the globalization side, um, you know, in the company that uh, we've just been working, it's been quite common to see people coming in from other cultures as well. So you might have a Brazilian working in London, you might have a New Zealander working in London, <coughs> you might have uh, a, a, an English person working out in, in, in Singapore. So people are going to need to be flexible if they want to get on, but will everybody want to be flexible? Um, does everybody want to travel the globe? And if you're wanting the talent, maybe you're going to get a much more diverse workforce as well. Um, if we then move to the diversity group, five questions were posed to that group. Um, and it was quite interesting to have a look at some of their insights. I'll let you just read that one. I was sharing with some people that one of our clients has moved into a state of art, an art building, and its workers are mourning their old, cramped, gruesome conditions. What's that? God knows. Must be something about culture. Um, another thought you need to do things in a very different way. So, any organisation who's stuck in a rut, doing things the same old, same old way is going to find it difficult. Um, other insights. I think that's going to be quite interesting, that perhaps with agile working, more autonomy 
And I thought Terry was saying, well, you know that you get an extra day out of your people. So that resonates, I would imagine, with, with where you're coming from. And then the cynic, of course. There would always have to be a cynic. If you work harder, uh, work smarter, not harder, but if you work smarter, you'll be given more to do. So how many of you fit, felt that creep of overload? You know, it's just there, isn't it? Um, so that's uh, good stuff. So, more autonomy equals greater job satisfaction. Um, Sarah Jackson was, was quoted on that. Um, but we're still so scared about letting go. Manager has to be in control. So can we let go? This is one of the questions. And this one I find fascinating, and it goes back to one of my favourite themes, which is, you know, that if you cannot justify or quantify the benefits of flexible working, you're going to have a very hard job <coughs> convincing somebody. So again, dear old HR professionals will need to think about metrics. And if they can't think in metric terms, we've got a real problem. Um, accountants do. HR needs to learn that language and learn it fast. Um, because we need to have it at the top of our fingertips. Um, we need to be able to give this data instantly. So say, for example, you're noticing that one manager has a higher turnover than others in terms of their staff. What is being done to get that manager to understand the cost he or she is making or causing the business? By some simple calculations about high turnover, this equates to this amount of expenditure, this amount of time wasted, and then do we give that manager a performance bonus because he or she has got a higher turnover of staff? Interesting. So we need to look at some of the, the, the secrets that the numbers can indicate for us um, on that side. Um, so I think... For a while, people almost denied that the recession was having a, a, a toll on them, <coughs> some visible stuff. Everybody was saying, oh, we're fine, we're fine. I know for, for, for our business, 2011 was the worst. Um, and talking to other people now, in 2014, they're now admitting that 2011 was bad. But it, while you were in it, oh, no, everything's fine. You know, ship's burning, but we're fine. So open-mindedness will also help in terms of medium and long-term planning. The other thing that's a little bit scary is that if the business is to survive, a large number of businesses have no formal planning mechanisms in place. How many of you have regular planning sessions in your business? A projection for 2014, 15, 16, 17? How many hands? We've got three hands. Four hands. Okay. So this ability to sit together and say, okay, what's going to happen in about three years' time? Where are we going to be? What, where do we want to be? Will help. And again, if you can involve all of the team in that planning, then they own some of that future. I find this one quite a bit shocking. Clients and customers need to be told that they're not going to get the same level of service that they used to get in the past. I don't know. That's uh, interesting. They need to know that the same employee can't be available. That's okay. But then how do you share that knowledge? If Mr. Bloggs rings up at the wrong time and doesn't get the right employee to talk to them, if the computer systems then don't link it up, how many of you have had those interesting conversations with utility companies where you keep on having to explain your little issue again and again and again? So this change of how we work is going to have 
some interesting times and this communication package of how we actually get everybody to understand what's happening to that particular customer is also going to be a challenge. And then ideas of flexibility. Um, people know they can go for it, that's flexible hours. They might need to uh, decide to follow up actions and present options. This is if everybody's playing nicely. And I really do wonder about this because um, if the team isn't playing nicely together, we can see, we will see some quite interesting conflicts. You know, if you've given one person holiday, and Rebecca will cover this, uh, or some flexible working, and then you can't afford for another person to go flexibly, what on earth is going to happen? So we'll need to think this one through. So it's going to get more and more complex as we grapple with that. I don't think anybody will have the solution. And concepts of fairness and people's expectations. There's some lovely work by a guy called Wilson Wong, called uh, Contours of Fairness, and he talks about um, HR has in the past always struggled for, uh, we've, we've got to deal with people equally, we've got to be consistent in our judgments, but one person's consistency and uh, uh, may actually cause another person to feel unfairly treated. So for example, uh, an organisation has decided to celebrate and take its whole team to Ibiza. <coughs> Who in this room would love that for a two-day uh, celebration? The few. Okay. Who in this world room would absolutely hate it? Okay. <laughs> but the whole company's going. Uh, as a reward for this organisation, I'm not so sure that that was carefully thought through. And we, the cynics in this room, will know that it's bound to have got messy somewhere along the line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're thinking about office parties. God, two days in Ibiza. Um, this could be interesting. So people's concepts of fairness and, uh, and expectations are going to change. And we may be treating different people in different ways. And Carol and I can remember doing a, an HR audit with this uh, very sexy media company. This was a few years ago. And we were horrified at that time until we really started to think about it. They gave every individual in that company had an individual induction. And we were going through the thought, oh, this is not a good use of time. We should be able to cluster this together. Until we actually discovered because everybody had totally different rates of pay, bonus packages, and if you were a creative darling, you could have whatever you wanted. And that's why they did individual inductions. You, down to cars, whatever, whatever. And they were paying for the creative genius. And this is quite a few years ago. God knows what they're up to now. I think we should go back and have a look. Um, be interesting to see. So, I think we're facing some really interesting challenges from the people domain in terms of needing all, all of our talents, uh, skills to keep the show on the road. Um, because when we look at what flexible working can be, and I'll just layer it on, I mean, just look at this bloody list. I think that's it. Yes, it is. Um, it's just quite scary. 